I'd like to start by thanking all the speakers for giving up their valuable time today to come and share their knowledge um, with everyone here. Um, I'm guessing that their time is even more valuable now um, since COVID started, given their special, your special interests. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who has come here to listen. Um, I, you've come to learn about um, COVID and POTS and I can't even begin to tell you how much your patients uh, value this. I'm just going to screen share my slides. There we go. Um, so uh, my declarations are that I've been on the long COVID expert panel um, for NICE and um, I've received speaker payments on occasion for talks on POTS and long COVID. So um, in, at the end of 2020, uh, NICE developed its first guideline on the long term effects of COVID-19. Um, they collaborated with NICE, uh, with um, SIGN, which is the Scottish equivalent of NICE, um, and also with the Royal College of GPs. And I think this was their first collaboration. Um, the recommendations made by the committee were as evidence-based as was possible at the time, given the newness of the um, condition. Um, the committee um, was comprised of healthcare professionals and a number of lay people, mostly, but not all patients. And, and due to the lack of um, evidence, um, at times, um, expert testimony was called upon. And then the, um, the draft was um, sent out to stakeholders for consultation. Um, the three phases um, described by NICE are acute COVID-19, which is up to four weeks, ongoing symptomatic COVID, which is from four to 12 weeks, and post-COVID-19 syndrome, which is signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19, bearing in mind that testing wasn't available at the beginning, um, and continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. Um, these um, three stages were um, introduced for a number of reasons, um, partly for coding and partly for research. Um, long COVID, importantly, is the patient-derived term, and um, that's made up of ongoing symptomatic and post-COVID-19. So acute um, COVID has um, surged recently, as you can see from this graph, and in fact, almost 71% of the English population um, have now tested positive for COVID since the testing was introduced. And you can see that the percentages um, of people who've tested positive um, vary from country to country throughout the UK. And unsurprisingly, um, this graph shows the increase in um, people affected by long COVID um, in thousands. And as of May, 2 million people in the UK were experiencing um, long COVID symptoms. And that is over 3% of the population. And remember that um, healthcare staff are sometimes also patients. And by last September, nearly 2 million uh, days had been lost in the NHS due to staff absences as a consequence of long COVID. The most common symptoms um, are fatigue, shortness of breath, cough and muscle ache, um, although um, around 200 symptoms have been documented. And long COVID is more common in people um, aged between 35 and 65 um, in females in people living in deprived areas or working in um, social care, education or healthcare. And it's also more common in people with um, other disabilities. Um, the symptoms are currently adversely affecting the day-to-day -day activities of 1.4 million people 
um, in the UK, that's um, just under three quarters of people affected by COVID, long COVID. Um, it's also rather concerning that there seems to be an increase in long COVID in children. Um, and currently one in 20 secondary school children are experiencing long COVID symptoms following their most recent infection. So today, in addition to long COVID, we're going to um, have a focus on autonomic dysfunction, sometimes also known as dysautonomia. So I just thought I'd briefly discuss what that means. Um, the autonomic nervous system controls the bodily functions that we don't have to think about. Um, and there are a number of them, including, um, the, for example, um, the, the pupil function in the eye, breathing, um, gut function, sweating, bladder function, um, and heart rate and blood pressure control. Um, and when the heart rate and blood pressure control by the autonomic nervous system doesn't work properly, um, it commonly causes orthostatic intolerance. And this is the development of symptoms in the upright position that are relieved by lying down. Um, and these are your usual sort of pre-syncope symptoms such as lightheadedness, um, nausea, sweating, palpitations and so on. And there are four syndromes of orthostatic intolerance, um, vasovagal syncope, where there's a reflex drop in blood pressure and often a pause or reduction in heart rate. Um, POTS, orthostatic hypertension, where there's a drop in blood pressure of 20 over 10 or more. Um, and non-specific orthostatic intolerance, that's pre-syncope sym symptoms, um, but where patients on that occasion don't test positive for any of the preceding three syndromes. Um, so regarding um, autonomic dysfunction in long COVID, there have been um, a number of recent publications since the condition was uh, recognised. These have tended to be individual case reports leading on to um, some small case series. They tend to be retrospective with uh, relatively few numbers and no controls. Um, they're often a highly selected cohort of patients. Um, the research is often done in a very specialised autonomic clinic setting. Um, and the diagnosis of COVID-19 was um, generally or, or often um, made um, based on symptoms as testing wasn't always available in the early stages. Um, and people have used different testing um, procedures and different diagnostic criteria for POTS in, in these studies. Um, they're pretty much all adult studies and there's little in the way of follow-up. And this is a selection of a few of the um, more recent studies. And unfortunately, we don't have time today to, to go into these um, in any detail. But just a few observations that they're mostly younger women and um, they've often not been hospitalized. Despite having quite prominent cardiac symptoms, their cardiac tests are usually normal. Um, they have been, um, they're treated with lifestyle measures and then it's not uncommon for them to require medication. Um, some people note that they've had minor autonomic symptoms before their COVID-19 infection, but perhaps didn't recognize the relevance of them at the time. Um, some studies have shown evidence of small fiber neuropathy on skin biopsy and reduced cerebral blood flow was seen in the upright position in patients with POTS and patients with um, long COVID without POTS, um, but not in the control group. Um, and then generally speaking, as far as we can tell now, long COVID POTS tends to mirror non-COVID POTS in terms of symptoms and response to treatment. In long COVID, orthostatic intolerance can be due to orthostatic hypertension, um, less commonly, um, and vasovagal syncope, not as common. Um, POTS is quite common and non-specific orthostatic intolerance is probably the most common um, syndrome that's seen. Um, the prevalence of POTS in long COVID clinics um, is not yet fully clear, um, but approximately a fifth of long COVID clinic patients have autonomic symptoms. And certainly um, I've spoken to specialists from the UK, from um, the USA, um, from Sweden, 
and they're all no noticing a huge surge in the number of referrals to their clinics. And NICE recommends for people who have postural symptoms, that's the symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, um, in the setting of long COVID, um, carry out a lying and standing blood pressure um, for three minutes if orthostatic hypertension is suspected and 10 minutes um, for POTS. So I just briefly want to present a case history to you and we've asked the speakers where it's relevant to their talk if they could perhaps address how they would approach the management the investigation and management um, of this patient it's a 37 year old lady and she developed symptoms in june last year um, she had a fever cough breathlessness and loss of taste and smell, so fairly typical symptoms at the time. Um, and she tested positive for COVID-19. Um, the acute symptoms settled after a week, although she remained a little breathless. However, she went on to develop um, new fluctuating symptoms that included um, fatigue and cognitive um, difficulties or brain fog, fast palpitations during the day when she was up and about, a sort of crushing heavy chest pain, um, lightheadedness on standing um, and a, a kind of allergic type rash, difficulty sleeping, uh, prickling pains in her um, and, and pins and needles in her lower arms and her lower legs and difficulty with exercise. She found that she was even struggling to climb up a flight of stairs and, and any exercise was making her exhausted. In her past medical history, she had mild asthma um, on a salbutamol inhaler. Um, and she'd had one COVID immunisation um, prior to developing her COVID-19 infection. Um, her parents, although she was born in the UK, her parents are both originally from Pakistan and her uncle died of a myocardial infarction or heart attack at quite a young age. Um, and he complained of chest pains and palpitations shortly before he died. Um, she was, she's a, a single mum of um, two children um, and in fact, one of them developed um, long-term effects of COVID-19. Um, she was working as a bank nurse, um, in other words, on a self-employed basis, and her income protection policy would now not provide any payment for her um, for long-term sick leave, as they assessed her fit for work despite her GP agreeing that she was not fit to work. Um, she was very tearful that she'd had three attempts to return to work unsuccessfully during times when she felt a little better. Um, nursing was um, you know, a very important role in her life and this had been taken away from her. Um, some work colleagues were quite skeptical about her diagnosis and appeared to have lost respect for her and were really quite resentful that she wasn't returning to work. Um, she was feeling a burden on her elderly um, parents who were having to help her with her childcare um, and obviously she had financial um, concerns due to la loss of income. So on that note, I'm going to hand back to our chairs.